people have always had a kind of a bloodlust for anything where people might lose their lives. The study of armor uh, is one of the great forms of, uh, of art and technology in, uh, in the history of, uh, of world cultures. They like to go wailing at their enemies with very big swords. One good whack to your skull and it, it's all over. If you develop a kind of armor that's going to provide um, better protection, somebody's going to come up with a better type of, uh, of offensive weapon to be used against it. This piece of chain mail is more than 2,000 years old. It would take a skilled craftsman as much as one year to construct one. Despite being very heavy, as much as 30 pounds, this armor was absolutely essential to a warrior. It meant the difference between life and death. It may have survived battle, but time is a more relentless opponent. Very few of these metal artifacts endure centuries of weather and rust. The ones that do survive need to be meticulously restored by another skilled craftsman, this time at a museum. The work is crucial. To understand arms and armor is to understand the history of humanity itself. The study of armor uh, is one of the great forms of, uh, of art and technology in, uh, in the history of, uh, of world cultures. Corey Keeble is one of the curators of world cultures at the Royal Ontario Museum. He is an expert on European mail and armor. One of the things that uh, you'll find is that uh, each culture uh, has had its own approach to the design of arms and armor. It's always offense, defense, defense, offense. It's the mouse and mouse trap idea that um, you come up with a better mouse trap, somebody's going to come up with a better mouse. Most museums, like the ROM, have vaults with more treasures and antiquities than there is ever room to display. Rob Mason, an archaeological scientist, is a specialist in Middle and Near East cultures. He researches and manages the museum's collection of arms and armor from these regions. This is the behind the scenes. This is the storage area, the, the vaults, as it's called. Um, high security coming in here, and you really have to know what you're doing to get in here and have all the right passes and all that sort of thing. Really, we have enough for an entire other museum, possibly even two more museums, behind the scenes. We have armor and arms going back to 500 BC, that sort of thing. Um, and before that, into the Bronze Age, about 1,000 years, 2,000 years BC. The chess match between armor and arms likely started with the first weapon. There are two main areas in which the development of primitive weapons can progress. One is the sharpness of the weapon being used, and the other is the velocity of which it can be propelled. Stone Age man discovered that a sharp stone attached to a long stick could help him fell a primitive beast. The sharpness of the weapon helped him pierce the thick hide, and the added length of the stick enabled him to increase the force of the blow and attack the animal without getting too close. Flash forward a few thousand years to the Middle Ages and the discovery of melting bronze and later iron to create a rigid, sharp weapon head that could be attached to a long pole. Spears were one of the first weapons created in large quantity for ancient warriors. This would have been one of the chief weapons of the ancient warrior, the spear. Uh, spears are often uh, under-emphasized in, in movies because they just don't seem so, I don't know, sexy as swords. But really, spears would have been far more important in ancient warfare because for a number of reasons. For one thing, they're much easier to make than swords. Uh, the, the sort of technology, the skill of the blacksmith it requires to make uh, a spear is much less than a swordsmith. So really, it's far more economical. And it's actually also much easier to train someone to use a spear with a shield than it is to use a sword. Because you basically do this, you see. So if you have a spear and a shield, you hide behind the shield like this and poke at your opponent like that. Whereas if you're using a sword, you have to engage your opponent more. 
so you can't do this. And the Romans did this. So it's really very easy to train a whole bunch of peasants, give them a shield, give them a spear, say, stay behind the shield and poke at the other guy like this, than it is to use a, a sword, because it's a lot of waving around and skill. It was discovered that bronze and iron were rigid enough to create an effective sword. Metal can be ground into a sharp edge, and even more importantly, with metal being such a precious commodity, it could be reused. Swords are made by melting metal and pouring it into a cast mold. If a sword shatters, the pieces can be melted and recast. Archaeologists have found large hordes of weapons, tools, and lumps of melted metal stored for future use. So this is a typical good quality sword of the Middle East going back to possibly even the Roman period. The Middle East is where you would get some of the finest steel in the world. And this is made, uh, the light gray is low carbon steel, which is, uh, tends to be softer and more flexible. And the darker gray is high carbon steel, which is, takes, is, is more brittle, but takes a sharper edge. So by folding the two together, you have a blade which is at the same time flexible, but incredibly sharp. Blacksmiths began to travel with the army. For small objects, like spear points and axe heads, casting is a very flexible technology. Weapons and repairs can be made wherever a small furnace can be set up. Suddenly, the threat of extended battle was a reality. The uh, long straight sword is actually a Celtic invention. Uh, civilized people didn't need long swords. They had civilized forms of warfare involving spears and, and bows. But for the uh, heroic Celts, who would often run around going into battle, battle stark naked and screaming their lungs out, they liked to go wailing at their enemies with very big swords. And uh, this became popular, and everyone else wanted a long sword as well, just to keep up with the Celts. As technology advanced to create stronger weapons, the need for better body protection became paramount. Historical body armor can be separated into three classifications, lamellar, chain mail, and plate armor. In the Middle Ages, with advancement of iron weapons, armor consisted of heavy fabric with steel plates woven into strategic areas. Known as lamellar, these hardened leather, steel-enforced coats were the earliest form of full body armor. These are pieces of lamellar armor, which are actually very old, about 500 BC, and from Assyria in northern Iraq. And these would have been excavated on an archaeological site. And now they're just plates of steel, which have all been rusted, and there's hardly anything left of it, but they've all been stuck together by the rust. But originally, you can see they would have been sewn together and would have been a piece of armor worn by a new Assyrian warrior. This is actually a Japanese piece of, of, of leg armor. And this shows how lamellar armor, see these are plates of steel, which are actually covered with bamboo, would have functioned with textiles, keeping it together. And this is a bronze version of the same sort of thing. Here you can see the holes where these have all been sewn together to make the armor. And most ancient armor would have been of this nature, it would have been lamellar armor. Along with the need for better body protection came the need for some means of protecting the head. It was an easy step for the blacksmith, who was now proficient with molding and casting iron, to create an iron hat to protect the warrior. The iron helmet was born. Fundamentally, the idea is to protect the skull, which is you know, a very important part to, of, your head, of your body to protect, because you know, one good whack to your skull and it, it's all over. Another thing I'll often protect is, is your nose. If you've ever been whacked on the nose, you know that's also not a good thing. And so that you will have what is called a nasal to protect the nose, and, and that, in this case, is retractable. Um, one of the reasons it's retractable is, is one of the methods of warfare in the Middle East was archery. And so this sort of gets in the way when you're shooting a bow, believe me, because I've tried it. Other aspects it has would be this chain mail, this kamel around the back to protect the neck. Typically, helmets from this part of the world, the face would be open. So this helmet, again, is, is quite late. It's from Iran. Uh, it's just a couple of hundred years old or so, but it's, it's a very, very typical form. Uh, 
Middle Eastern helmet forms go back in this nature of way back to pre-Islamic times. As the battle between arms and armor raged across Europe, a new type of protection was forged. Chain mail became the elite in body protection. It could defend against every enemy except time. During the Middle Ages, man perfected the art of casting deadly weapons made out of iron. Battles now raged long and fierce throughout Europe. Heavy lamellar suits were no longer able to withstand the onslaught of iron swords and spears. With life and limb in peril, soldiers demanded better defensive armor, and chainmail became the ultimate solution for full body protection. And mail is a, is a general protective device to stop, particularly cuts. It's very good at cuts. Um, and this has been quite, had a very long history in the Middle East and South Asia because of the quality of the steel. This first type of mail consisted of large, heavy rings sewn edge to edge onto a leather shirt. The makers of ring lamellar soon realized they could make the armor even stronger by linking the rings together. They discarded the leather shirt altogether and created a body shirt made completely of linked iron rings. This heavy male shirt became the official armor of the early Middle Ages. There is a certain agreement that, uh, that male probably came into being somewhere in the Celtic world, maybe uh, around uh, the fifth century BC. Male has um, both um, what we might call liabilities and assets. One of its uh, assets, which is also one of its liabilities, is that it's flexible. Um, you can make a male shirt, which you put on um, over your head, and the weight is borne on your shoulders. Uh, a male shirt, a male coat, might weigh as much as uh, 20 or 30 pounds. It is very useful against uh, a sword cut. If it is made finely enough, if the links are small enough and sufficiently close together, it can provide protection against um, spears, penetration from sword points, to a certain degree, penetration from, uh, from, from arrows. But uh, it's not very good as far as defense against a, a percussion weapon like a mace. The design of chainmail can be wide and varied, with each culture putting their own unique stamp on the type of mail they manufactured. There are a number of uh, distinctions between uh, types of mail. Um, there is the nature of the rings themselves. A lot of Middle Eastern uh, and South Asian mail, the, some of the rings will actually be solid, which I, I don't think happens a lot in, in Europe. Um, they'll have a series of solid rings. That, you know, they were made as rings. They aren't wire, which has then been looped together. And then they will be linked together by rings which have been cut and then welded and riveted together. And so that is one distinction. The more rings you have going through another ring, and the more rings there are in the suit, so the more, the stronger it is, the less likely someone will be able to cut through it. This is a, a heavier suit, which is, um, again, has a lot of links in it. These, you can see, these are all welded here. See, that's a welded one. See, it's got a rivet through it, and then it's welded together. But every other one is solid. See, there's no join there at all. So you have a row of solid rings and then a row of riveted and welded rings to keep them all together. And, and it's much bigger links, much heavier links, and so all together it weighs a lot more. So here you can see in the sleeve, in the same suit as, as this, that the links are much finer. So the, the strength is preferred in the body rather than in the arms. Chainmail was an extremely labor-intensive, time-consuming project. It could take up to a year to assemble a full-length male shirt. It was a luxury afforded mostly by nobility, who would often use the armor to protect themselves and their families. 
This one's quite interesting. It has a, a velvet lining. Because this would be worn as an undergarment. Just the sort of thing if you were worried about an assassin coming and slipping a dagger in between your ribs. This one has its legs built into the body. And as you can see, it's pretty small. So I would have to assume it's for a child or a very, very small person. Um, if this child is the heir to a throne, then they're actually a very worthwhile possession you want to keep safe. So having your children running around in chainmail isn't such a bad idea. These intricate heavy suits were made of thousands of individual metal rings woven together to create a full coat of armor. Corey Keeble unravels the secret to this technological marvel of the Middle Ages. This is uh, an expanded model uh, to show how mail is made. It's something that we had on display in one of our cases. How do you make mail? Well, what you do is you take a long piece of wire, which is itself handmade, and you wind the wire around a stick. Of course, the, uh, the real thing is much, much smaller than this. In any event, you wind wire around a stick. Then what you do is you take some sort of cutting device, maybe a chisel, and you cut through the wire so that you end up with a whole series of links of exactly the same shape. You get dozens and dozens of these. And once you have these standard-sized pieces of, of metal, which are already in the form of a, of a circle, we have to flatten them. Then we flatten both ends. And when the ends are flattened, they are overlapped. And when the ends are overlapped, we have to make a hole here. This, uh, this gives you a very good idea of the difference between the model, which is gigantic scale, and the actual reality of, uh, say, 15th or 16th century mail itself. You can see that the, the links are, are really quite small, but there is one of the links which actually shows the, uh, shows the rivet. Susan Stock is one of the Royal Ontario Museum's metal conservators. Her work involves assessing and authenticating treasures the museum acquires, as well as restoring pieces to their former glory. We try and acquire things that are in better condition, obviously, but important things aren't necessarily in perfect condition. Um, this is basically a shirt, 17th century. So in actual fact, it survived very well and in very good condition. I mean, the amount of rust is minimal and it's actually physical damage, structural damage more than corrosion damage. Highly trained conservators like Susan must study each artifact carefully before beginning any type of restoration process. These artifacts are more than 3,000 years old. Recovering them was a minor miracle in itself. So Susan's main goal is to restore the piece to as much of its original condition as possible without incurring any damage. She has only one chance to get it right. The stuff that I've been working on is generally got a lot of holes. Uh, the male links can rust out, and so there are holes, because they've actually rust out, they're missing. And this is the first time it's come to the lab, and you can see the kind of condition that it's in, which I wouldn't say is exactly displayable. So somebody has tried to fabricate or hold. It sort of looks like a spider's web more than anything else. There's areas that are knotted together. Some of the links open, so where they're riveted, they get caught. It's almost like snagging a nylon. And then people add other bits of wire, things that don't belong, you can see here. Sometimes in the past what they've done is they've actually made big knots using um, modern links to try and repair the holes so that it doesn't look like it. And it actually bunches, looks like a bunch of grapes. So I try and unravel those and then rework the pieces so that it actually fits or the, the links marry. So what I would do is open it up and try and assess basically, you know, what exactly am I gonna have to do to this piece to make it look like a shirt and actually be secure and stable in itself. 
and you can see the, the number of links that are missing or open, which have left this kind of hole all over. I would have a look at it, decide where I can marry them or re-knit them. I don't like to add new links unless I really, really have to. A key part of restoring and conserving is to maintain the integrity of the artifact as much as possible. It is important that future historians are able to examine our treasures in accurate condition. What we try and do in conservation is be reversible, number one, and we try and change the artifact as little as possible. So you want to improve it from an aesthetic point of view and make it more readable. Well, structurally, where it's important, I'm going to try and marry the links. Uh, what I would do is look to see if there are any links that are open nearby and then knit them back in. This link is open, so the rivet has been lost. So of course, oh, with handling, it's actually opened up a hole. So I would take some pliers, which I've taped so that I don't have a metal to metal problem. And then you would open it up slightly and then I would follow the links so that I'm actually marrying this piece to that piece. And then close it up using pressure only. And I'm twisting the links in the proper way. And then that would get rid of the hole so that it's not visible and it's secure. Since mail has such a high surface area of steel, it's extremely prone to rust and disintegration. Therefore, very few pieces of mail have been discovered intact, and their preservation is an arduous, time-consuming project. It's really, it's a three-dimensional jigsaw. Once you understand the piece, you get into a groove and the knitting becomes easier. I don't like to add foreign material if I can help it, but if I have to, and I can see here in the front that structurally it may need something. You can see here where there, oh, there's a mass of links and very often there's some extras. So I'm going to have to unravel this mess. <laughs> Let's see, I think it's caught just right here. There, now it can lie flat at least. No object is exactly the same, and no two sections on an object is exactly the same. So it always means that you're doing tests to see how efficient and what the best technique will be for cleaning. And then you try and follow that through. If you can use the same technique across a whole object, you're really, really lucky. And with very light surface cleaning, probably I'd wipe it off first using a pad or a vacuum it lightly. Make sure the edges are intact. Over the course of thousands of years, forces of nature have corroded these metal links to such an extent that quite often, rust is the only thing holding them together. Special tools have been developed for conservators to ensure that delicate artifacts remain intact. So I have a huge variety of tools and equipment and um, bits and pieces that I use. Very often with metal objects are corroded and so there'll be significant details which are absolutely obscured by the corrosion. You can see here where there's areas of rusting. And I'll try and clean those up. Normally also I wouldn't wear cotton gloves because they snag and they leave fibers over the surface. So um, I'd be wearing vinyl. The original owners of chainmail armor often covered the mail with oil or grease. Not only did it repel moisture, it encouraged an opponent's weapon to slip off the armor. Oil, however, attracts and holds dirt. Susan has to carefully clean centuries of dirt off of each individual link before it can be put on public display. Well, originally, uh, some of the suits were so oily and greasy because they used to oil them as a corrosion preventative measure. Normally we use uh, mechanical abrasion, mechanical means, and I use a lot of solvents, but I don't like chemical cleaning, partially because when you use chemicals, there's residues. The residues are very difficult to remove. And on something like this, other than the links that I showed you that are lightly rusted, I almost don't feel that it requires very much cleaning at all. You want to remove 
this kind of dirt. And if it's stable, my attitude is don't mess with it. I have a variety of tools. I can either use brushes like these stencil brushes for lifting dirt. So it's just a mild brushing action. In the old days also, we used to use glass fiber brushes, and these things are really quite dangerous. You don't want to inhale them. When they stick in your finger, they're really, really painful. So I now avoid using this unless I really need to because of the hazard of using it. Chemical solvents such as ethanol or acetone are commonly used to cut through grease without damaging the artifact. Recently, what I've started using and I find is really helpful is a Scotch-Brite pad. They are abrasive pads. Uh, they have the advantage over steel wool, which was used in the past of not breaking down and creating that steel wool frass, which is another cleaning problem. So these things stay intact. They work with the solvents that I like to use the most, ethanol and acetone. And I'll cut them down into a much smaller shape. I obviously do a test first, always, before I use anything, because I don't want some of these links to be bright, bright, shiny metal. I want it to have a very cohesive, very even look. Um, leaving it stable, of course. So I would use this pad and put it behind as a backing just to absorb any of the dirt or frass that I might lift. So you can see there's a little bit of iron corrosion on that. What I would do, take a bit of cotton wool, You can see just using a solvent, I'm actually lifting a fair amount of iron corrosion off, loose powdery corrosion. In this case, it's much thicker. So I'll reduce it with my scalpel, working just locally. The restoration of a full shirt may take several days. In this condition, I would say probably a week. Uh, sometimes it goes really quickly, like you just get into a groove and it just, you know, you sail through it. This is really actually in really, really nice condition. So the work will really be involved in just stabilizing the holes as they exist and trying to make it look cohesive. Once this conservation process is complete, suits of armor are carefully preserved in humidity and temperature controlled display cases. If I had my druthers, I'd keep it below 19% at least. But when there's organic material involved in the gallery or in the display or on the object itself, for instance, a leather collar, or sometimes there's beautiful velvet studded collars and so on and other components, you've got to then consider 40 to 45 percent. Most of our mail and armor is in cases, so encasing it is critical. And if it's in a case which is airtight, you have a much better chance of buffering it, even if it doesn't have another form of climate control, against huge swings in relative humidity. I have seen very, very little active corrosion on any of the objects that we have put on display. Another important aspect would be mounts, because in actual fact, these objects are delicate. And so when they're mounted, you want to have the pieces supported properly. So careful mounting and careful support of the artifact for long-term storage and display is really critical. Although an amazing feat of technology, by the late 1400s, chainmail was no longer an effective piece of armor. The fact is that if you develop a kind of armor that's going to provide um, better protection, somebody's going to come up with a better type of, uh, of offensive weapon to be used against it, in which case you respond by developing. Uh, this is what happened, uh, certainly in the Middle Ages. The next advancement in weaponry was so deadly, it was outlawed by the Catholic Church. An arms race began to develop armor that would protect the soldier from something he had never encountered before. For centuries, the most effective armor in the world was chainmail. 
but one advancement in weaponry forced it out of the battlefield. Someone finally found a way to make a sharp object hit harder, much harder. The crossbow is believed by some to be the major factor in the transition from mail to plate armor. The crossbow was capable of penetrating shields and mail and still have enough force to keep moving. The Roman church saw the destructive power of the crossbow and took a firm stand against it. In 1139, Pope Innocent II created an embargo known as the anathema. This stated that the use of crossbows against Christians opposed the will of God and all soldiers were forbidden to use it. The longbow was also used with deadly effectiveness against mail. The longbow was powerful enough to pierce through a soldier's mail-wrapped leg with enough force to then move through the rider's horse, mortally wounding it. As far as the weapons, uh, it's partly the improvement in, um, in swords, the improvement in uh, uh, percussion weapons, uh, also, of course, the, uh, the improvements in archery, the longbow and the crossbow. And the longbow is, uh, is a major figure in this. There are some who have argued that uh, the development of plate armor was actually accelerated by the introduction of weapons such as the English longbow. So again, it's the same thing. It's offense, defense. It's uh, it's the old um, <laughs> better mouse, better mouse trap, better mouse trap, better mouse. It's this endless um, either cycle or to and fro. With the deadly accuracy of the crossbow and longbow, helmets became crucial protection for a knight in battle. Up until the 1300s, uh, the principal headpiece is uh, is, is a fairly large barrel-shaped helmet. And underneath that, uh, there would be a male hood, almost like the like a ski mask um, with the front cut out. And there might be a steel cap known as a cervelier, uh, either under or over. Um, but in the 1300s, we begin to find new types of helmet, uh, the bassinet or the uh, hundsgugel, as it's sometimes <laughs> called in German. Uh, which is a helmet which is curved and uh, it has uh, a male fringe underneath it. Eventually the male fringe, which protects the area around the chin and the throat, will be replaced by solid steel plates. The visored helmets really begin to increase in number and variety in the 14th century. Uh, by the time we get to the 15th century, we have the introduction of even newer, different types of, of helmet, the sallet, uh, which is a helmet with a long tail at the back, like a, a modern firefighter's helmet. Uh, some had visors, some didn't have visors. We have uh, open helmets, which allow a maximum degree of, of vision. Uh, closed helmets with visors, which always have a problem, they're stuffy. They're not heavy because the average helmet around here only weighs a few pounds, maybe you know, four pounds, three pounds, five pounds. Um, but with a helmet with a visor, something that closes around the face, it's the heat inside. It's um, mildly asphyxiating. Although rarely found intact on the battlefield, Susan Stock's team was able to conserve the helmet of a Mughal prince for observation. This is an 18th century Mughal prince's helmet. It had holes, the mail was hanging, there were missing links all over, especially around the perimeter where you can see that some of the holes are not complete, they had broken through, so they were hanging there, they were, there was mail missing, and you can see how with careful marrying of the links, it actually looks complete and it hangs beautifully. It's very sophisticated. We wanted to support these new links, which have been added. They're slightly larger than the originals. They're in a different material, and then they're painted or patinated to look the same as the originals with light like corrosion. And behind, we actually have hung a piece of mylar, which is perforated with holes to match the holes around the bottom edge. The other problem was is that when it came to the lab, you have this absolutely beautiful damascened gold decoration down the nose piece and around the perimeter. Uh, there are two plume holders, and there was a third plume holder, which was kind of hanging uh, from the top. We did some research, compared this helmet to others in the collection, and we realized, uh, you can see here, this was 
actually not the original plume holder, even if there had been a third and central one. The actual post is way too long, and it would have penetrated the Mughal prince's skull if he had actually used it. So this was um, a modification. The actual crest was probably missing. And so we wanted to make something that would complement the piece and not return this, which is a pastiche and likely belongs to another helmet. It's not even the same pattern as the original ones. So we made, out of epoxy resin, this lovely post, the crest, and then patinated it using Japanese pigments, so it's very multicultural, to make it look integral and to match those in our own collection. So it's part of the conservation treatment to actually make it look as regal as the regal prints would have looked. So we just cleaned the visible rust from the bowl to brighten that. And so now it really, really does look spectacular. With the development of the crossbow, the longbow, and percussive weapons like the mace, armor in the 1500s reached a new plateau. Metal chest plates were worn over the mail to protect vulnerable body parts. The decision to dress knights in full plate armor was the next logical step. We can see it with the development of, uh, of plate armor through the 14th uh, and 15th centuries, that in a sense, the plate armor of the 1400s is a response to um, improvements in, uh, in weaponry. Fully articulated body armor required the skills of a specialist, an artisan who would measure each body part of the knight and create a piece of armor specifically designed for him. Uh, when we deal with armor, plate armor, we're dealing with the skills of the sculptor. Uh, we're dealing with the, uh, the skills of, um, of craftsmen, artists, who have to be more adept at their art than goldsmiths and silversmiths because steel is harder to work than gold and silver, which are relatively soft. So the armorer is really a combination of uh, a sculptor, um, in, a, in a sense a kind of machinist, because he's devising something which in fact is a kind of exoskeleton which has to be mobile, you have to be able to move in it. So he has to have the skills of an anatomist. He has to know the human skeletal and muscular system perfectly. At the same time, he has to be able to shape metal with the skill of a sculptor or the skill of a goldsmith, a silversmith. And more than that, the armor also has to be a portraitist because he has to make an armor that will fit the wearer exactly. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about uh, the difference between, uh, what should we say, an ordinary horse-drawn cart and what we would uh, equate with something like a, a Rolls Royce. <laughs> Only wealthy knights could afford to be dressed in their own Rolls Royce suit of armor. Most knights had to be satisfied with a standard suit of armor purchased off the rack from the local blacksmith. By the 1400s, uh, certainly at the time of the Italian Wars in the 1490s, uh, we have types of armor that were actually being developed, uh, sort of standard armors, uh, for the combatants. And this is a sort of uh, off-the-rack, off-the-shelf type of armor, uh, sort of small, medium, large, but made in st standard forms. Um, and that is very different from the kind of really deluxe armor which is made only for the very wealthy and which may be made for battle purposes, but by the 1500s increasingly is going to be designed for display, for parade, for pomp and circumstance. A lot of arms and armor used for the Middle Ages was just scrounged from, uh, from the field of battle. So that the normal practice in battle was that uh, you picked up, you cleaned up, a very ecologically sound by the way, you clean up after the battle and you try to reuse all this stuff. So you might get a helmet from one source and maybe a piece of mail from another source and maybe a sword from someone else. And uh, these bits and pieces that were constantly being scrounged were used until uh, they had just about uh, disintegrated totally. Once a knight has managed to acquire a suit of armor, the question arises, how to take care of it? How do you look after your suit of armor? Well, if you have mail, uh, the early technique for cleaning mail was to uh, put it into a barrel of sand and roll the barrel. Early historians confirm that chain mail was put into a barrel full of four parts sand and one part vinegar and rolled for hours until the mail sparkled like new. 
Plate armor had its own particular set of problems. Um, armor can be scoured, and one of the difficulties with scouring armor is that um, armor in some collections, decorated armor, uh, was pretty much scratched down to the bare metal uh, during the 1600s and, uh, and 1700s, uh, where a lot of the original de decoration was just, uh, just cleaned off. It was then up to the owner of the armor to pay a local artist to have his coat of arms or other identifying colors repainted on his armor. Being a knight was an expensive business. Along with plate armor and helmets, shields were used to increase defense. Uh, the shield is very important in the early part of the Middle Ages, and the shield becomes important for two reasons. Um, shield, normally carried on your left arm, uh, of course, is very useful for defense, but when you have a helmet uh, that hides your head so that nobody can tell who in heaven's name you are, the shield becomes very useful for providing identification. So the shield, which is usually wood, uh, which has a, a layer perhaps of, uh, of leather textile on it, begins to be the field for your coat of arms. And so with plate armor, shields, and helmets, it seemed the defense of the knight was impenetrable. However, the development of gunpowder and firearms in the 1300s meant the battle between arms and armor would continue. By the late 1300s, we have um, a kind of paradox because uh, in the late 1300s, we not only have the perfection of a complete exoskeleton of steel, but it's also a period of transition because it's in the 1300s that we also have the introduction to the European field of battle of firearms. Um, primitive cannon, primitive handguns by the late 1300s, early 1400s. And it's also in the 1300s that we have the development of uh, compelling tactics and uh, rudimentary strategy for infantry. So the 14th century period is a, is a period where a lot of things are happening, and they're happening for many different reasons. Uh, 13th century is another one of those watersheds in European history, and it is a period where technological advances are beginning to accelerate, and that's certainly uh, the case in the field of, uh, of arms and armor, armor and arms, and this whole process begins to speed up as we approach the dawning of the modern era. So with the improvements in um, infantry tactics through the 1300s, 1400s, early 1500s, we find that, uh, that handguns become important, not because of their accuracy or their range. They really do not have a range anywhere near a longbow or crossbow. Uh, their penetrating power is limited, but if you have hundreds or thousands of them, they simply pump an enormous quantity of lead into the field. And um, that is really what, uh, what relates very much to the introduction of, uh, uh, of firearms. And you'll notice the change in armor where we begin to have a dent in the breastplate, which is a proof mark. In the 1400s, plate armor was, uh, was proofed against crossbows. You would simply put a piece of, uh, of, of steel, like a breastplate, uh, against a wall or on a stand, and you discharge a crossbow at it. Uh, you could discharge a, a small crossbow, one mark, a uh, big heavy crossbow, maybe two marks, and uh, that shows that the armor is proof against the best uh, penetrating weapon of the day. Well, by the time we move into the 1500s, we have uh, guns that are being used to test the strength of the steel plate. They leave a dent, and the dent often shows on the breastplate to show that uh, the armor has been proofed. This is particularly the case with um, armor from, say, the early 1600s. <laughs> with the onslaught of guns and ammunition overpowering knights on the battlefield, full plate armor and the men who inhabited them eventually moved to the relative safety of the tournament arena. It was a time of chivalry and romance to be revered in book and song for centuries to come. Armor found its niche in entertainment and sports arenas. In the late 1500s, 
advanced weapons and gunpowder took over the battlefields. Full plate armor was no longer effective, but it didn't disappear. In gigantic coliseums, built for the express purposes of entertaining the nobility, knights in shining armor became the show of the century. In Europe, you had this emphasis on the knight and how much, because I mean, basically the state was ruled by the knights. You couldn't be a king unless you were a knight. And so the knight was possibly the most important individual in society. And so more and more was invested in these guys on the horses. I think it's very important not to uh, see the art of the armor merely in terms of, uh, of battle, because we have parade armors, we have armors for show, armors for presentation. And there is this reality that um, if clothes make the man or the woman, uh, so does a suit of armor. Knights in shining armor became revered in society, and success in the sports arena became just as crucial as success on the battlefield. But unlike the battlefield, the element of danger had been somewhat tapered. By the 1400s, uh, we have the evolution of different types of armor for different purposes. And we're talking about uh, forms of armor that can be used on horseback, the sort of armor that could be used um, in war, but also kinds of armor that could be used in sport. Tournament helmets um, are quite different from the ones used in battle. They tend to be much more solid on the left side because if you're holding a lance under your right arm, you're actually aiming at the left profile or the left side of your opponent's helmet. So helmets used in jousting tend to be much more solid. Often they have no breaths, uh, the holes that you use you know, for, for breathing. You'll notice that on the right side there are breaths. Um, but on the left, often nothing but a, but a solid uh, plate of, of steel. Because if, uh, if I'm using a lance or if I swing with a sword, the blow is going to come against the left side of, uh, of your opponent. So that in jousting, we find forms of armor where the left arm is reinforced. There may be a special reinforcing gauntlet for the left hand, and where there is a reinforced for the left side of the helmet. Uh, the lances that would be used could be uh, pointed lances, uh, depending on the, on the type of joust, or they could be lances which, uh, which have coronal tips, and like a tiny little crown, uh, so that uh, you do as little damage to your opponent as possible. Great change, actually, from earlier medieval tournaments, which were, which were quite bloody. Lances in jousting, which have a crown-shaped uh, sort of safety feature point instead of a nice, long, sharp steel point, because the aim is not to run your opponent through, but to put on a marvelous display of horsemanship and skill and directing a lance, which is sort of flapping up and down in the, uh, in the breeze. As only the wealthy could afford full suits of armor, it quickly became a status symbol among the nobility. Parade armor was created to clearly separate the haves from the have-nots. The development of armor is not merely associated uh, with defense. There is a whole psychological realm. I mean, there is a certain element of, of masquerade. There is also a certain sense of, uh, of dressing up. Since full armor was worn by people in uh, uh, positions of, uh, of power, prestige, wealth, uh, armor was intended to uh, enhance, to, uh, to glorify the wearer, to make the wearer look larger than life, to, to make the wearer look more important. So that armor, in effect, creates a completely new persona for the wearer. When you move into the 1500s, there is a major shift in terms of the development of parade armor. Armors that were designed really uh, as status symbols, as uh, statements of, uh, of power, of wealth. And um, you'll find that there are decorated weapons as well to go along with all of this. Very elaborate sculptural sword hilts, um, extremely complex uh, forms of, uh, of cast ordnance. Cannon, for example, that to all intents and purposes are works of sculpture as much as anything else. And then, of course, in the field of uh, the firearms, the extreme elaboration, uh, the decoration of, uh, of pieces that are intended either for parade or presentation, really for high diplomacy, for high statecraft, uh, the sort of thing that um, uh, a prime minister, 
of one country might give to another in our own modern era. Our culture remains fascinated with medieval times. From folklore to Hollywood movies, we still embrace the culture of chivalry and knights in shining armor. Medieval Times is a theatrical reenactment that recreates the medieval experience for packed crowds every day. Lee Cordner is the show director. Well, what we're trying to do is, is recreate the excitement that would have been yours if you would have attended a medieval tournament a thousand years ago. In, in other words, the suspense, uh, the men in combat, uh, the speed, the violence of the activity, but to put it in more of an entertainment frame. The tournament itself is based in sport. I mean, but people have always had a kind of a bloodlust for anything where people might lose their lives. The whole knights on horseback and armor thing was so closely linked to romance and chivalry that regardless of how many generations go by since they fought with swords or used crossbows, it's always linked to the romance, which, you know what I mean, carries through century to century. So I think it was its link originally with the ideal of like uh, romantic idealism and chivalry and a man's obligation to love and to womanhood that's, that keeps carrying it through. Our fascination with and use of armor continues to this day. Plate armor, helmets, and shields are used in our own police and military forces, and protective armor is used in almost every sport. The art of the armorer has applications to uh, our own era, that in a sense, uh, armor has been reinvented uh, in the 20th and the 21st centuries. And it's reinvented in part in World War I, but it's also reinvented in uh, the context of, uh, of modern um, protective clothing. Um, if you think of the bunker suits that are worn by firefighters, that's armor. The helmets, in many cases, are very similar to the helmets that were worn in the, in the late Middle Ages. The 1970s introduction of Kevlar body armor brought sheet metal trauma plates back into fashion. U.S. soldiers in Iraq presently wear lightweight Kevlar helmets and vests, augmented with steel plates. Present-day sports like football and hockey protect their players with body armor. Uh, if you think of the armor for, uh, for football, for hockey, uh, for other sports, um, any variety of, uh, of modern forms of armor. So uh, uh, the whole idea of, uh, of armor, in a sense, goes in cycles. And it's making a very dramatic reappearance in our own age. As we observe the progress of man throughout history, we can see that the development of armor relates directly to the development of technology. As weapons advanced, so did armor in a cat-and-mouse game that still continues today. Yeah.